on of the usage of this session. Who here is new tonight? All right, what's your name? Shelly. Shelly, welcome. Where do you work? Um, at Lone Wolf. Oh, nice. I know a lot of people that work at Lone Wolf, like John Farling and Ben Brian Gray. Yes. This guy over here is sitting next to you. I said, hey, you should come tonight. <laughs> yeah. Tell Brian to say like, congratulations on everything. Okay. I'm new this year, like awesome. last year. Um, I'm Shelly, too. <laughs> <laughs> Different company. Nice. I'm at some. Excellent. Welcome. I, I'm at Innisfere as well. Oh, welcome. Thanks. And your name is? Jenny. Yeah, for everyone. Jenny? Excellent. All right. Dude in the back, your name? Yeah, black shirt. What's your name? Uh, Oh no, I was here last time. You were here last time? What's your name? Emilio. Emilio, why didn't you be to introduce yourself last time? I don't remember. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so it never happened. Oh. Oh yeah, we did have that problem. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. All right. Well, for anyone that's new, welcome. For all those that are returning, because I see a lot of familiar faces, welcome back. So glad to see you guys. Um, welcome to tonight's session. It will be our last session before the summer break. And so then you'll have two months of peace and quiet. I won't bother you with anything. And then we'll pick back up in September. In September, I'm going to be running two sessions a month. I'm going to be running a Xamarin hands-on lab once a month at the downtown library, the central library. And Ken Centarelli, yeah, he's going to be taking over this session. So he'll be organizing and um, scheduling the, the talks for this section, the session for .NET specific topics that are outside of Xamarin. Um, so if you have recommendations for topics that you want to see coming up, uh, definitely message Ken Centarelli or myself or both of us on the Meetup site. Um, we're definitely happy to take your recommendations. If any topics that are popular, we will get some speakers in and sessions in scheduled for those. And there is going to be a link to a survey that Lori's going to show in a couple seconds. We actually ask you on the survey as well, is there any topics you want to see? So you thought something or didn't you? Exactly. Good point. So just thanks to tonight's sponsors, Microsoft, the uh, financial sponsor for the season. So for all the months we don't have uh, sponsor coverage, they kind of fill in the gaps. Infragistics for sponsoring like licenses, as well as DevExpress, Pluralsight, Ozcode, JetBrains, Code Connect, Code Magazine, MS MSDM Magazine, and Reflect Software. They've all been amazing spike sponsors as well. Absolutely love these guys. And I know a lot of people here have won licenses to those things, and I hope you've been enjoying those products. Yeah. Um, so we do have a year-end survey. Uh, we did this last year. It worked out really well. Uh, just like about 10 questions. You know, they're pretty quick answer questions just to let us know what you're thinking uh, of our sessions and what we have planned for the future, if you're interested or not. Uh, there's some questions about upcoming possibility of workshops that we may be hosting and things like that. Um, so definitely please take a few moments to answer those questions. It really makes a difference in us planning the next season uh, and making sure it's relevant to you guys and it's stuff that you want to see and you're interested in. Uh, if you love to tweet, definitely uh, follow us on Twitter and use the hashtags uh, for our user group CTTDNUG and use the hashtag PowerShell for tonight as well because tonight's topic is about PowerShell. Come on, armbands. Okay, bumped up. So I'm using the Mile armband, which is amazing. I don't know if I've seen this yet. And this is my first night testing it out. I won it at a, an event earlier in the week. It was called uh, like the Eureka Year End Gala for the Year Code Waterloo Region. If you're not familiar with that, um, they're a nonprofit and they're all about teaching uh, digital literacy in the community. And so they run various sessions in libraries and in schools to teach uh, teenagers, young adults, and even children of how to code. I just finished a six week pilot program with them. It was a Hacker Girls program where about 20 mentors went to schools all across the region. And we spent an hour a week with the young girls and we taught them how to code. And it was pretty awesome, phenomenal. I blogged about it. Um, and then we celebrated at the year in gala, and then there was a raffle, and then I joked about, like, if I won the armband, I was totally going to use it tonight. <laughs> and then I actually won the armband, and then I ran down like it was Price is Right screaming. Like, <laughs> it's really embarrassing. Anyway, so uh, rate, rate our meetup after tonight's session. Just go on to our meetup site, give it, you know, how many stars you, you think we deserve. If there's comments you want to add in that help us plan future sessions or help Arlen 
tailor his sessions or if you want to give him great praise for his amazing session tonight, definitely go on there and do that. There's a job postings board, so if your company's hiring, just go on there and add your job postings. Just take them down when you fill them. Uh, it's free. I don't charge for anything like that. It's just a community board, so add to it at will and take down at will. And if you're looking for work, check that board out. So, you know, I, I have been noticing more postings going up lately, so that's great. And for the next season, starting in September, we are looking for sponsors starting in the new season because we do run two sessions a month. Uh, so it helps us pay for the venue and for the food and uh, travel expenses for any speakers coming in from out of town, which we have had a few. They've been pretty awesome this year. So upcoming events. <coughs> Do I, can I get this working? <coughs> yes. All right. Dev Teach, July 4th <coughs> to the 8th in Montreal. Arla is <coughs> speaking at it, Ken is speaking at it, and another user group member, Tom Walker, if you guys recall. He used to help out with the, our user group and now he runs his own in London. He's speaking at it. I'm attending, I'm just going as a fan. So I'll be running around getting people to sign things and geeking out the whole time. I'm not actually gonna be doing any work there. But it'll be fun. Hackernest runs a social event every month. So in July, they're at the TV Waterloo Technology Center. That should be interesting. Last month it was at Clear, Clear Path Robotics and I absolutely had a blast because we actually had a tour through the plant. So you guys missed out. Like, if you didn't go to it, you totally missed out. PRDC, Prairie Dev Con, they have a new conference called Deliver, which is more focused on software, architecture, best practices, <coughs> DevOps, rather than just the like, uh, companies focused on developers and, and coding and technical things. So this is more high level, so if that's your thing, you're interested in it, uh, sign up for the mailing list, registration will be opening soon. If you're interested in submitting uh, a session topic to talk there, uh, call for Papers is open, so go on the site, submit your session topics if you're interested in, in uh, exploring speaking at conferences. It's a lot of fun. Uh, I recommended Arlen already to, to, I told you already that you better get on there, so yeah. So yeah. Next. No? Okay. MVP Mix, they're coming back October 17th to 18th. Last year they held a one day session at the Microsoft office. This year, I guess, they decided to go for two, so I guess it was a success. Uh, so that should be a lot of fun. Registration will open soon. And with that, I will let Arlen take the floor. It's here on such a beautiful day. Um, so this is also a chance to try out some new ideas. So you're actually a guinea pig, you just don't realize it yet. <laughs> <laughs> you will soon enough, though. But uh, let me just. Um, okay. So, for the first time ever, we will be actually having an audio and a visual component to the presentation. So, it's something new. Lori's really excited about it. She's disappointed I dropped the Abby <laughs> Wong clip, but we were trying to keep it to at least 14A for this presentation, <laughs> if not G. So. <coughs> So the presentation is Work Smarter, Automate Your Manual Tasks with PowerShell. So it's evolved quite a bit from the original concept back in December, January, and I was going to actually present in February. But things changed, weather changed, and actually my perspective has changed a lot as well over time on what it means to work smarter, what is automation, and what's the role of PowerShell as well. So, so what are we covering today? So there's really two blocks here, and I'm going to try to break it up between the first half and then the break and the <coughs> second half. So the first half to me is the most important part, which is trying to answer why you should be using PowerShell. And I don't mean this PowerShell in a very generic fashion, but why you, know, you really need to learn PowerShell. It's very important, and it's not simply used by IT pros or for this simple administrative task. There's some real important elements to it, but also, PowerShell is also a, an easy way to understand a concept of automation and how it rolls up into the convergence of different technologies that are related to the changing work environment. And when I talk about automation, I won't be talking about anything like Google's self-driving car or uh, autopilot on Tesla or anything like that, but there's a huge amount of evolution of the technology and it's actually going to impact us in ways too that you may not fully appreciate right now. Some people probably do. Some people already know more than I do about it. But over the past four months, my perspective has changed a lot on what it means to be uh, in the technology field and how it's evolving and changing. 
So the first block is really to ask, answer the question of why you should learn it and why you should be exposed to automation, why it's fundamental to the work you're doing. If not now, it will be. Or your company will have to change or will be forced to change. Now, it may not happen tomorrow, but change is coming. The second one actually talks about PowerShell and talks about some of the pragmatic elements of learning it. The only way I learn any type of language, PowerShell or anything else, is by actually working with it. So if you're expecting a session, uh, me typing away at a command prompt, you'd be disappointed. But if you're looking for all the resources you need to learn it effectively by having it all distilled down to the best out there, which is what we've already done, because we use it ourselves as a resource, uh, that's all available to you. So the first part should say, yes, I want to learn PowerShell, here's why. Okay. So, I love this quote. Um, if you work with any type of large corporation and you're used to conference calls with a dozen people on it, um, everyone feels like they're getting something done. They're all busy, they all have email, they all have documents, <coughs> but there's actually a little work actually getting done. They don't seem to be aware of that, but if you actually work for a living where you're paid for your time and actual um, deliveries, you feel that very strongly. So, um, and it's interesting to see that evolution. So my company, by the way, I assumed you actually knew who I was after. <laughs> Laura introduced me, but my name is Earl Lugera. I work for Alvin Corporation. And it's a small company of four people right now. And we tend to work with large companies in the financial space, so in the fintech financial technology space. What's interesting is to see the changes going on there and how oblivious a lot of them are to it. Once you get into that certain corporate environment, you start to lose track of what is normal and what and how the change and pace of it is evolving over time. So that's why I like that phrase, automate things or get automated out. And it's interesting to talk to some of the project managers that's actually occurring already at the technology and operations level. So. so what I have in this presentation is something a little different. Um, you probably don't know who I am and my credibility probably may not mean much to you, but there are some people here that I want to have a few short minutes of uh, a chance to talk through this presentation that I think you should actually hear what they have to say. And but one of the first people I've chosen is Jeffrey Snowbird. Uh, he's the chief architect for Enterprise Cloud. So what that really means, besides the fact that he was actually the original PowerShell inventor back over 10 years ago, when he actually came up with the concept of PowerShell for the Windows environment, the idea was that he was actually looking at a tool to allow what is now referred to as DevOps. So he was talking about that whole concept about infrastructure managed through software tools and being able to work with uh, IT pros as well as developers. And the whole concept was actually used white paper from over 10 years ago, which is really an interesting reading. But at the current level, he's a Microsoft Technical Fellow, which is a very the top senior level technical title <laughs> at Microsoft. Not a business title, but a technical title. So um, besides being in charge of Windows 2016 and the Nano server and PowerShell, he's also in charge of Azure Stack. Short okay. So the next slide actually has a video, a short three minute clip. There's a few more clips coming after this, and then after that, the clips are over. Okay. So. Right to the old way. The Click Next admin model, right? So if you're a Click Next admin, here's the bottom line. Sorry to say it, you're not driving a lot of business value, right? Next, next, next. I mean, you might be a wonderful person but you're not really driving business value, okay? So concretely, if you just hit next, you're providing a standard offering, a standard offering that can very easily be replaced uh, at a far better service level agreement and far cheaper by a software as a service offering in the cloud. And that will happen, no doubt about it. However, if you're doing more than click next, if you're saying, hey, this is a great component, but I'm gonna turn it into a business asset by doing something different than the other people. If you're doing things the same as everybody else, you're not adding business value. But there are opportunities to take and deploy technology in a way that provide business talent, value. That's who you wanna be, right? You wanna be that guy, right? So you don't wanna just be hitting click, 
click next. You want to be automating. You want to be adding value. Next is you don't want to have these snowflake servers, right? This is the idea of a snowflake server where everyone is unique and precious. No, no, no. Some people like the term uh, 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 cattle and pets, right? So you don't want to treat your servers like pets, right? Where you give each one a name, and when they get sick, you get all worried, and you call the vet. No, that's an old way of doing things. You want to move to a much more mature, you know, kind of DevOps model, right? Where you have lots of servers, and there's no drama, right? You don't name the servers Fluffy. <laughs> you give them a number, uh, and when they get sick, you know, you just replace them, right? There's no drama. Okay, that's a more DevOps mindset. Uh, and it's also about bulk management, right? The ability to do lots of things to, to stuff. So you want to stop, uh, click next admin. You want to stop treating things like snowflake servers. Uh, and what you want to do is you want to start uh, embracing a DevOps mindset. Right? So then let's talk about Windows Server 2016 because it really is a transformational release, you know? So if you're used to Windows Server and you just want to treat it like your old Windows Server, you can do that. But really what I'm saying is this is a transformational release. I'm laying down the architectural foundations really for the next 20 years of server. And so if you jump on board, if you're the people that figure this out sooner than everybody else, uh, you are going to have a big advantage. So what am I talking about? Nano server and containers. Dramatically lower resource uh, consumption, dramatically lower security footprint, uh, dramatically lower serviceability. Boy, if you can get your stuff running on this and deploy this and get good, great, you could get great at that, uh, you are going to have fantastic advantages, and people are going to really kind of turn their head and say, "Wow." Additionally, we have new ways to uh, configure things with desired state configuration. Of course, PowerShell. If you haven't learned PowerShell, you know, McFly, what are you waiting for? Uh, <laughs> you got to learn PowerShell. All right. So there you go. Right on the man's mouth, you need to learn PowerShell. And that's the reference he was talking about. If you haven't seen this before, <laughs> that's the first image that came to my mind when I saw him speak about this. That could be you. So the whole concept of PowerShell is not just for servers, even though he's talking a lot about servers and configuration and infrastructure management, and PowerShell has a lot of use in that infrastructure space. The whole DevOps aspect, which he's mentioned, and also the reference to Azure, which is coming up shortly, PowerShell is a common thread through all of them. Giving, having a knowledge of PowerShell gives you access to all these technologies in a way that is deeper and more meaningful than simply using it as at a very high level, like uh, some of the Azure facilities available to you. So, I will come back to that whole concept, but the whole idea with PowerShell is that it is a fundamental technology. And even though, I'll be getting to it a little later, but you will find that from a developer's point of view, it's something that you will really need in your tool set. As the IT pro is I'm not sure how many IT pros are here compared to software developers, but the IT pro role is changing dramatically through automation and the cloud. As that shift occurs, a lot of that opportunities are moving to developers right now, and they're expected to be able to interact with infrastructure in an automated fashion or through the cloud. And I'll come to that more shortly. So, Now, my company and myself, we work in the fintech space, financial technology. Uh, Jessica Moore actually is um, well known for being uh, probably the youngest successful CEO in Silicon Valley at the age of 19. She works and built up a company called Indonero, which actually is a fintech company. And what's interesting about it is that not only do startups no longer invest in infrastructure where they go off and buy servers and racks and so on, they tend to use the cloud, but also one of the things that they've been doing more and more is that they've been relying on automation to a high degree. And even though she's not probably talking about PowerShell in this case, the whole concept is automation, and PowerShell is part of the Microsoft technology stack, and that's what this user group is about, so I'm referring to it, but from a larger point of view, automation is key. So what I want to do is just have a short one minute clip about that aspect. A lot of people call it in an era a services company because we do accounting and tax for businesses, and I find that hilarious because I personally don't see us as a service business. And our investors obviously don't see us as a service business, otherwise they wouldn't invest a penny in our business. The way I thought about it is 
we want to automate away a lot of the work that people are doing manually. And we've done this since day one. So every single person we hire, if they're doing anything manual, we say, don't think of yourself as being uh, someone who's doing work. Think of yourself as a strategist. You're here to help us build the technology to basically take yourself out of that job and then move you to something else. And then you're going to help us automate that work away too. And that gets everyone excited. So the entire culture in the company is about automation and efficiency. And that's the only way we've been able to scale our company. And so every few quarters, we're able to make it so that we're 30% more efficient. Then after another two more quarters, another 30% more efficient. And it gets better and better over time. And if we didn't do that, we'd have easily five times more staff. So I found that last statement very interesting, five times more staff. What we're seeing is <coughs> companies are struggling to find the level of quality and quantity of staff that need from a software development point of view. They've tried outsourcing, they've tried all of these different strategies. And what they're looking to do is now use these technology tools to replicate the truly exceptional software developers and talent, IT pros as well, and be able to replicate that across the infrastructure for their company's needs without just trying to go through a cycle of outsourcing and trying to hire people and compete and so on. And what Jessica Marr was talking about was a chance with the technology available today to actually meet those kind of demands through tools as opposed to hiring people. When Jeffrey Snow was talking before about Snowflake service, where servers were considered uh, special and unique, we may be coming to a point where developers <coughs> do not think of themselves as sort of Snowflake developers, special and unique. That may not tr be true for a lot of developers going forward. The truly competent, the truly exceptional skill sets that can work across both from a development point of view and infrastructure point of view, that whole DevOps aspect, uh, will be the ones in demand, and a lot of the tools available will allow all the context work of supporting technology and the company will be automated away. So that's my perspective based on a lot of things I've been looking at and researching as well. And that discussion actually goes right across the board in the whole economy. And in the IT world, we feel that we're sort of exempt from that because of the kind of work we do. We're not. Uh, IT pros are feeling first, but they will also fill over into the software development world as well. So. So PowerShell actually is a very low-hanging fruit for software developers, people who are comfortable with Microsoft Technology Stack, to actually get entry into that place, uh, understanding how the elements of technology work together, and be at that level where you're in demand and will continue to be in demand. Okay. So the next one is a little different. Um, as I've been exploring this concept of automation and future of work in the IT world, and PowerShell and all those elements. The next one is a really interesting one um, it's from a different company, IBM. But you'll have a. In today's world, the volume of unstructured information is growing at an enormous rate. We really need better technologies to help make sense of it and make better decisions. At IBM, we're seeing the new era of computing, starting with the tabulating era, then to the programmable computer era, and now cognitive computing systems, which expand the boundaries of human cognition, become smarter with use, and have a much more natural interaction between the human and the computer. In the area of artificial intelligence, there were a lot of amazing ideas, but computational capabilities just weren't ready for them. Watson suddenly makes some of these crazy ideas possible. At the core, we're trying to leverage knowledge the way humans record and communicate it, natural human language, and in particular, text. Its initial introduction to the world was as a competitor on the Jeopardy quiz show in the healthcare space, we're approaching it as a support tool to expand the physician's cognitive boundaries by giving them deeper access to much larger volumes of information, the history associated with the patient, the journal articles, clinical results, best practice guidelines, etc. That volume of content is doubling every five years. Physicians have precious little time to keep up with everything. A system like Watson can leverage the computer's ability to deal with huge volumes of data, understand the knowledge that's contained within this data, apply it to the problem that the physician is trying to solve, give them different alternatives to consider, and in particular, the underlying evidence that supports those alternatives. That basic problem-solving pattern applies to a wide variety of industries. Any area where you have
entire complex problems that you're trying to solve. We're adapting the computer technology to work better with the way humans want to work so that it's a more natural relationship between the human and the computer. So, taking the concept of automation to a next level, which is the changing the way we actually think of how software is developed, how people would interact with it, how they would use our services. So again, this one is really a, another piece of that puzzle that I'm hoping when you look at it collectively, it starts to give you the impression that in our world from a technology perspective, as people who actually do software development and provide services in the IT field, um, we're going to be changing a lot in what we do as well. So there's one last one coming up, this is a short one. But to me, it's sort of the end point of that natural evolution of technology and uh, our interaction with it. Automation going further than the concept of IBM wants. And, and you might recognize this. Open the pod bay doors, Hal. I'm sorry, Dave. I'm afraid I can't do that. What's the problem? I think you know what the problem is just as well as I do. All right. So, to me, that's sort of the final end point of this level of automation, along with um, cognitive abilities of computers to converge to the point where we now become a subservient part of that role. So, that was an interesting element. I just thought of put that in there. But if that's not your concept of a computer overlord future, there's always Siri here. And, um, my favorite. Okay. So, as you can see, the face can change, but the concept is that we're on a, a wave of change that even we are not fully aware of. Not that I'm fully aware of, but dwelling into this whole aspect of automation and changing the role of our work and how we interact with technology has brought along some interesting ideas that I want to share with you. Going back to PowerShell, what does that have to do with PowerShell? Well, you will not be working with any of these technologies probably in any realistic capacity at the present in most of the work you're doing. Um, but PowerShell gives you access to a lot of concepts and uh, infrastructure and other access to this concept of the evolving technology platform that is very easy and accessible, and especially on the concept of automation. So when I look at this whole automation aspect, a big part of that and what I also see is a good fit into that model is the whole hyperscale cloud infrastructure. Uh, it's not possible without the level of automation that we have currently. In the case of Microsoft Azure, the whole cent data centers that are being managed throughout the world, the core technology being used is PowerShell. Okay. PowerShell 5 that's currently out is fundamental not only to Microsoft Azure, but also something called Microsoft Azure Stack, which I'll just mention briefly coming up shortly, but also Windows Server 2016. So again, PowerShell gives you a chance to access the technology and become um, comfortable with something that might actually be investing a huge amount of time and effort into. So all these data centers around the world are managed through PowerShell to an enormous degree. And when we talk about hyperscale clouds and regions and automation, we're talking about huge. You're talking about 600,000 servers in some Azure regions. Just to give you an idea of what that looks like, this photo was released by Microsoft a few months ago. So normally they don't like to release pictures of their data centers. They don't even generally tours of the data centers either. But if you look at this here, you see a data center can have multiple stages of evolution. So part one of the evolution, part two of the data center, and then they add different sections to it over time. It's still one data center. Just to give you a scale of this um, photo, that red circle there, that's a 18-wheeler, a full truck. Okay, so that gives you a sense of scale. Now what's interesting is if you look at the size of the data center, if you notice the number of cars parked in front, they're very few. Okay. So that's the first two cycles of uh, build up for that data center. It's actually located in somewhere in the northeast of the US. To give you an idea how big this is evolving, that's a shot of the next set of evolution of the data center. Okay, so this is going on all around the world as far as this consolidation of infrastructure and also outsourcing from companies into this scale. And this scale is managed through, in this case, with Azure with PowerShell. So as you can see, if you look back at the top here, you can actually see those first two stages of 
that data set of development. So as you can see, it's, it's big. And it's amazing to think that you can use something like PowerShell on your desktop to automate simple daily tasks, um, to do automated builds on your local computer, but also be used to manage thousands of servers across multiple regions concurrently. Can I ask a question? Sure. That's all great, but what happens if there's an electromagnetic pulse in the region of that data center? Well, if there's a, you mean like a, a large solar flare? Yeah, or whatever. Sure, I mean, is, is that it hardened against stuff like that? Well, no, but neither are the satellites and everything else around. Like, we would have a catastrophic meltdown if there was anything of that caliber would hit the Earth at this point. So, yes, the data centers would be in a lot of trouble, but so would all the communication satellites, GPS satellites, and so on. So, it would be a widespread <coughs> catastrophe of unbelievable proportion. See, the thing about centralizing something like that, it, <laughs> well, it's a single point of failure. No, you've got to duplicate the data center. Yeah. yeah. And you can yeah. And yeah, so when you're looking at these data centers, they tend to come in pairs, so they tend to be paired up across the U.S. and so on. Like in Canada, there's one in Toronto, and there's one in Quebec City. The difference is that those kind of disasters, these are generally much more secure and much better managed than a typical corporate data center. And they have levels of redundancy and levels of efficiency that are hard to match in any corporation externally. So. Any type of disaster that could strike them, uh, any other data center would be just vulnerable, except they have a lot better planning in place for that. So, I mean, talking to one of the Microsoft uh, Azure um, uh, disaster recovery team members, when the tsunami hit in Japan, uh, and then there was the meltdown as well, the Fukushima reactor, they talked about all the plans that they kicked in automatically to move data from. Um, that those parts of Japan to other regions in that area, like Australia and Singapore and so on. And the way Microsoft did it would be hard to match with any other corporation. When I say corporation, I mean like, let's say, a bank or some, a company that doesn't specialize in technology. Right? So this is what they do. So, and they have the tools and processes to do that. And again, a big part of that actually is PowerShell, which is something they use extensively internally. Uh, Microsoft Azure Stack. I mean, we all have heard of Microsoft Azure. Not everyone may have heard about Azure Stack, but Azure Stack is basically uh, a fully functional version of Microsoft Azure without all the components yet available. What that means is that Azure Stack is designed to actually run in a data center and be managed through the portal and uh, tools that people would be very comfortable using in Azure. Microsoft Azure Stack itself is actually deployed uh, through a PowerShell script. So the whole Azure Stack itself is deployed into a data center using PowerShell. And the beauty of this is that whether it's Azure Stack running locally in your environment or hosted by a third party or Azure or Windows 2016 or Windows 10, PowerShell allows you to actually move data and uh, virtual machines all the way across all of those different platforms, which is quite remarkable when you think about it. Uh, just to give you an idea of how extensive that could be, we're talking about something like PowerShell design to actually work right across this whole different environment of Azure and Azure Stack and on-premise environments. And when I was talking before about moving uh, Hyper-V virtual machine images, we were actually talking about moving from your local Windows 10 machine, moving up to an Azure Stack implementation, moving up to Azure, and moving it back again if you have to. So we were talking about a ROM trip capabilities just using PowerShell, or oh, there's, other, there's other tools available, but I like what PowerShell is that it's like a Swiss Army knife. It is completely flexible and versatile, and at the same time, um, you know that Microsoft is completely dedicated to its growth and evolution because they use it so extensively internally. Okay, and I just mentioned before about all these technologies are tied together through PowerShell from a management point of view. So Windows 10, the Windows Server 2016, Nano Server, all of them are designed to work with PowerShell. So when you hear a lot about DevOps, and I'm not sure if you've attended any DevOps session, but it's very, very popular right now as far as the topic of um, both implementation and learning right now. Uh, all these 
DevOps practice of relying to a high degree on automation. Without automation, trying to watch a DevOps occur is just uh, comical at best. It, it needs a high level of automation. And one of the things that we've done at, at my company is that the ones you see in green, we've actually used PowerShell itself to automate. Now, when you look at the amount of tools available out there, you're probably wondering, well, why are we using PowerShell? Well, the simple reason is that exactly for the same reason you're looking at, there are so many tools out there, I can't afford to purchase them extensively, but really the real cost is the training required. And having a dozen tools to do a dozen things, even though they're best in class, gets extremely difficult and time consuming over time. PowerShell actually works really well for us for all the things you just saw previously. And out of those uh, five highlighted in green, we're actually using PowerShell for all that right now internally. Now, one of the benefits of this is that when we're dealing with a large client, if they're using any of Microsoft technology stuff, PowerShell is already installed in that environment. So we don't have to actually tell them they have to go to any new tools. We simply say, we need to we can provide you a PowerShell script. Here's what you need to execute. And what we found is that instead of dealing with a dozen people on some of these projects, we're down to four people. Project manager, one for the database, one for infrastructure, and another person. Um, but there's four people. So simply by providing a PowerShell script, we've actually got rid of a large group of people that I still quite, didn't quite know what they did in the first place, but now they're not there anymore either. So that's one of the reasons why we chose PowerShell, both from an internal point of view, but also when we're dealing with clients, since we work in the Microsoft technology stack and our clients do as well, it's a natural fit. And giving them a PowerShell script makes it very straightforward to convince them that this is the way the solution needs to roll out. Now testing is a, is a big aspect, and we use PowerShell for testing process as well. Um, the part that we're still working on, and there's a lot of different tools available for it as well related to UI testing, but the testing that we actually use it for extensively tend to be related to calling uh, different functions as part of the testing process and running different database processes. So what we've done is made the API of our software available and PowerShell simply just calls it and runs through it. Now what that allows us to do is, again, we can use PowerShell extensively for testing as opposed to coming up with other tools and so on. And the UI part is one of the things we're moving to as well. So the consequences of inefficiency. This is what one of the diagrams you see in uh, some of the DevOps presentations, actually from one of the DevOps presentations at my top place. But this whole concept of automation, evolving workflow, the relationship between developers and IT operations and infrastructure is changing dramatically. And the result is more and more levels of automation for cost savings, but also for higher delivery loads. And like I said, PowerShell is a very easy low-hanging fruit that people can easily access to experience this themselves. Okay. So that's the first part of the presentation, the why portion. And one of the things I'm hoping that it did was give you an idea that when you look at PowerShell, really what's interesting about it is it's, it's just a tool, and there's other tools out there that do automation. And, in other environments as well. But for the Microsoft technology side, PowerShell is a very powerful tool. And when you just start going up that process of thinking it through it, you start looking at automation as well. And sort of the evolution of our work and our profession, it gets into some really interesting ideas of what we would be doing. So to me, in many ways, the PowerShell was a, an easy mechanism to look at how things could evolve over time. So. So that's the first part. Uh, Lori, did you want to, when did you want to take a break? Yeah, we can take a break now, if that works. Uh, so we'll take like a five to 10 minute break.